Okay, good morning everyone. Um, now I know under the name it says Alexandra and you can see obviously that's uh, that's not me, it's uh, Amelia speaking to you. Um, the uh, computer seems to be having a bit of a personality disorder day, but that's all right. Um, welcome to uh, the second of the Jean Monnet webinars uh, for the EU Foreign Policy course uh, Quo Vadis. Um, it's good to have you all on tap. I know some of you who have emailed me this morning will be joining uh, a little bit later. It always depends on uh, what time people's lunch hours are and how that uh, how that lines up with their ability to get online. But don't forget, of course, that this is recorded, um, which is nice. It means it's a sort of permanent and um, accessible offering uh, later on in the month and, and uh, indeed in the term. So it's, a, it's also a, a viable um, exam tool as well when that day comes and come it will. So um, as you probably remember from the first one, the idea of the webinar is to give a, a brief survey um, of the majority of um, key points, salient points covered uh, by the previous lecturers. Um, we can't, of course, cover everything. Each one of us has 15 minutes um, today as we did last time. Um, but we'd like to try to highlight uh, the most important um, bits, which means we'll use, for the most part, the same slides, but um, a sort of critical minimum of, of them, if you like. So for myself, I'll, I'll be whizzing through a, a couple of them quite quickly. Others, I might take a little bit more time and, and, and draw your attention um, to areas of interest. I just want to remind you that there is the, the chat box in the lower left-hand corner, and you can always type in questions as, as we're discussing, um, and we can talk to people. Um, on the left-hand side above that, where it says participants, um, you can see who is joining. Just to make sure that you, you um, have the, the, the talk button um, and in fact, the video button off as well, because sometimes uh, this can um, uh, promote uh, um, interference problems, so do make sure that that's off. So we will um, move through the slides. As I said, each one of us is going to have about um, 15 minutes each, and this is the running order. I'll start. And in fact, this is, of course, exactly the way that it was taught to you in the class. The only um, slight difference is that you have already had one uh, lecture on CSDP issues by Daniel Fiat, um, but we're going to get him to do his webinar presentation in the third webinar uh, because it makes much more sense given the, the themes that we're going to be tackling this, this coming term. Um, then Alexander is going to follow me, and then Katya, uh, and then Magdalena, um, and then I'll just finish up at the end with a, a couple of little housekeeping activities and reminders for the, for the course itself. So as you may remember, all those weeks ago, uh, we talked about uh, the pre-Lisbon structures and the post-Lisbon changes, which is uh, frankly an enormous uh, amount of information for you to grasp. And there were a lot of readings for this, and I did say how important it was uh, to make sure that you had this um, under your belt. Uh, the nice thing is, you know, dimensions and themes uh, drawn from these various um, uh, changes, if you like, pre-Lisbon and post-Lisbon changes, are going to be tackled um, again and again by a variety of the lecturers this coming term um, from the perspective of foreign policy making, from the perspective of security uh, and defense, and then from uh, within the, the, the themes and the, the geographies, if you like, that make up the terrain of EU foreign policy. But um, in general, um, I think what, what I was trying to get at in terms of my own lecture was to, as you can see here, look um, at the sources um, of, of foreign policy um, with regards to uh, the, the European Union. Um, and I started uh, with a quote, a, a nice one, I think still a very salient one from Anand Menon. And it, it goes to the heart, I think, of the difficulty that the Union struggles with even now about how to uh, best uh, capture and then deploy its international impact. And the sort of duality that we see uh, between its, its uh, agreeably strong, even in these days, economic weight um, and then uh, the criticism that it, that it um, has uh, aimed at it in terms of not necessarily being able to, you know, a platform that or capitalize on that in terms in political terms, diplomatic terms, uh, and security and defense terms as well. So we're seeing already a sort of an un unevenness with regards to the type of actor or actorness that the European Union is um, and, and professes to represent. Um, again, I think with a view to history, um, it's important to recognize the sources um, of EU foreign policy, and they are myriad. Um, and I think it is important, I think, just to, to remember that foreign economic policy um, unusually, of course, comes first. Um, and this encompasses uh, trade, external trade, um, starting from the origins of the common commercial policy. And you remember the few slides that I, I had on these. And of course, uh, development, and more recently, humanitarian assistance. That itself is a wellspring, the original wellspring, if you like, of EU foreign policy. 
um, much later, um, and by this I, I think I, I generally mean the 1970s, you get foreign political policy and an increasing series of structures by which uh, political goals, political foreign policy ambitions are distilled through the European Council. Uh, even more recently than that, of course, we've, we've emerged into the area of security and defense policy. Um, and alongside that, the sort of um, internal uh, dimensions of external security, the, the rather interesting hybrid uh, overlap areas in which um, security and defense line up against themselves um, in what we used to know as the third pillar. Um, additional sources, of course, um, in terms of at least legislating, uh, include the European Commission, but of course now under Lisbon um, you have uh, a, a slightly different method, if you like, of, of making and creating policy, and that of course falls under the co-legislation co with, with the Parliament and the Council. Um, lest we forget uh, the role of the EU member states, of course, their own foreign policy and the, the um, role of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, as part and parcel of that. And then, um, somewhat cheekily, perhaps I put down the European External Action Service, we'll see um, not necessarily if it's particularly a source of foreign policy, but certainly uh, a, an area by which foreign policy can be calibrated uh, and maybe even oriented in, in, in the future. Um, as I said, a few um, slides on the, on the origins of some of these, and I'd, I'd like you to go back and remind yourself about the two types of foreign policy instruments that you get from trade because it is so very vitally important, your original trade instruments. Uh, and then your sort of, you know, the sandwich ability, if you like, of the community, you know, the union to, to build up in terms of cooperation agreements, not just on um, economic and commercial matters, but much more extensive political um, agreements and dialogues with countries. So really deepening um, that relationship and, and uh, leveraging it into a sort of strategic um, partnership, if you like. Again, with development policy, um, a, a tremendous vehicle, if you like, by which the European Union can capture um, and disseminate and even make conditional its own critical civic values in the third countries with which it wants to have uh, not just trade relations, but development policy relations. Um, I'm looking forward very much to having Mark Ott from the um, Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs join us in a few weeks to talk about how important it is um, that the European Union has a good strategic sense of what exactly it wants to do in terms of its development policy uh, to make a foreign um, affairs impact abroad. Um, and I think the association agreements that have sprung from um, these simple and then rather more complex um, um, structures, if you like, from the European Union can be uh, encapsulated in association agreement. It's a fairly generic catch-all um, term, but I think still quite a helpful one. And it ranges um, from fairly thin um, development policies that began under um, Yaoundé, in fact, and then moving up through, through the domain Cotonou agreements, um, to vastly more important and multi-sectoral cooperation agreements to the east and then to the south. Um, so again, you, 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 you see this sort of uh, differential attention, if you like, by the European Union as it um, sees the Europe agreements as a method by which to begin the process, at least, um, of enlargement. Euro-Mediterranean agreements themselves, um, the sort of 1.0, if you like, and then the European neighborhood action plans are rather more substantive uh, attempt to, to, to reach out into the neighborhood down the south, and then, of course, out to the east again, to the CIS countries. And on top of that now, although we're, we're still a little bit um, away from seeing how it's going to look in practice, development cooperation instrument, again, another multi-sectoral form of cooperation coming to us with a variety of budget tranches underneath it and a variety of, of, of political and economic ambitions on top of it. Um, one point I will say is that whatever it's going to look like, it's going to be vastly reduced from the initial ambitions, if you like, of, of, of development as it used to be. Um, moving along to, again, the, the, the newest and the least integrated area um, of foreign policy. I'm delighted that I don't have to go over this too, too much because we do have um, a very good series um, of lectures um, starting, in fact, this week um, regarding the strategic culture, um, the de development of the member states' um, own perspectives, um, and the, the moving, if you like, from European security and defense to common security and, and defense, um, the connections with NATO, the connections with the United Nations, um, and all, I think, in a sense, still surrounding this, this unhappy dyad, unhappy split personality problem between um, an Atlanticist dimension and a Europeanist dimension uh, with regards to the, the quality and the quantity um, of, of NATO on board um, and the, the qualitative attention to the, the type of EU military strength um, that we want to see here in the European Union. 
moving on, therefore, to some of the diplomatic tools. Um, I've just, I began with Nice, even though with the lecture, of course, I'm, I went much, much further back, just as a bit of a refresher in terms of the, the tools brought to us by that treaty, um, including enhanced QMV on decision making and, of course, um, enhanced cooperation. I spent a little bit of time on this because I'm still so fascinated by what appears to be such a, a good tool still has been so comprehensively not taken up. Um, and I, th I think it's, a, it's an interesting example of, of an area of, of breathing space, if you like, in a treaty that hasn't yet been capitalized on, but time will tell. Lisbon Treaty, again, gives you a variety of other diplomatic tools. And I think something I'd like you to consider, particularly those of you doing you know, your, your thesis on, on aspects of foreign policy, is the way in which these diplomatic tools have added to or perhaps um, acted as a break upon the European Union's ability to platform itself in the world, um, particularly the, the action service and um, the post of the high representative, uh, but also the efficiency and the effectiveness of the European Council president um, and the role of the, um, the developing role of European defense in terms of its ability uh, to promote a conflict prevention in hotspots um, around the world. Um, for the lawyers among you, or perhaps I should say the reverse for those who, among you who are not lawyers, it's important to have perhaps a little bit of clarification as to what the hell the Lisbon Treaty actually is. Um, and as you know, it is a consolidated treaty that amalgamates um, the Treaty on European Union, i.e. Maastricht. You can't, of course, renegotiate an existing treaty. Um, and the, the Treaty on the Economic Community, um, so establishing the community. This one, of course, renamed as the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU. So if you have a little bit of legal math, TFEU plus TEU equals the Lisbon Treaty. And it has really a marvelously memorable name. Treaty of Lisbon amending the treaty on the European Union and the treaty establishing the European community. And I um, expect you all, of course, to remember that in the exam. Lisbon changes naturally um, mean that the primary law of the Union um, encapsulates both of these, both the TFEU and the TEU. And they have the same legal value. I think that's also important as well. Um, Unhelpfully, I have to say, for those of us who like writing on the blackboard, um, it formally abolishes the EU's uh, three-pillar structure, and you have a rather less memorable spectrum or table, if you like, of competences, which we'll see in a minute. But it, to some extent, former pillar two areas um, remain, um, but they're not as clearly defined or found, if you like. They do, for the most part, operate still under intergovernmental decision-making procedures, so at least this much is helpful. More Lisbon, post-Lisbon diplomatic tools. Um, and I think it's, it's again, a, a key point to remember. Why is it that things like the new legal personality of the European Union or a variety of new CSDB tools, um, why have they put in there? How do they help EU actors? Uh, and if so, in what way? Um, I think you'll remember the slight textual analysis we did in class comparing Maastricht to Lisbon um, in terms of the actual articulation of CFSP substance. There are some changes there. For example, the reference to free and fair trade, the rights of the child, um, and uh, reference, of course, uh, clear reference to the development of international law. Why are they there? What are the, the rationale and the motivations behind them? Um, I want you also to bear in mind critically the four principles upon which European Union foreign policy making um, is, uh, stands and is in fact enabled. I don't have to go through them now. The slides are here, um, and the slides I gave you originally in the class um, are, are there as well. Competences, conferral, subsidiarity, and proportionality, and you can see them here laid out. In, in heartbreakingly lovely order. So it's important, I think, for you to be able to, to put those um, uh, into some uh, intelligent configuration in your heads. Um, you're going to see this uh, a second time, so I don't need to go through it too, too much. But again, in, in terms of the sort of post-pillar understanding of the competences uh, in the EU, this is not a bad way, at least, to kind of lining up the competences from strong to weak, top to bottom, and the external policy areas uh, that they encompass. Um, it, again, I think it's important to remember the reason as to why you find customs union competition at the top. Um, and the problem inherent, problems inherent in finding CFSP um, at the bottom as well. I also talked uh, about uh, the sort of the, the justiciable or lack of justiciable content with regards to the CFSP. Um, of course, the objectives can be amended at any time without limitation, but they, it's problematic to some degree because they're subject to fairly weak control, parliamentary and judicial control by the Parliament and the ECJ, although I'm pleased to say that the EP has an increasingly strong um, sense of its own oversight, at least. So there's, a, there's a strong commitment there. Um, a variety of interesting, important things on the basis of uh, procedures, unanimity, um, and of course, something very fiercely fought over by the member states, that they are not in any sense attenuated. They are not limited in their ability to make their own sovereign rights and to retain their ability uh, to make their own defense. 
Um, I finished this lecture with two important developments, Barroso State of the Union, in which it was sort of everything's going to hell in a handbasket, what do we do? And the, the, the main focus, of course, is to keep the classics. And a variety of new types of thinking, which bear very strongly upon the European Union's ability to make foreign policy, namely to accept the interconnected reality of the EU, um, and that a, a stronger understanding of how the EU operates in an inherently globalizing world. Um, and then, the, of course, the Nobel Prize given last September. Um, it's important to go back and have a quick look at the slide um, and the rationale given by the, the committee. And then the response, the joint statement uh, given by Von Rompuy and Barroso um, in, in terms of the uh, prize's um, ability to recognize, sustain, and possibly move on into the future, the, the EU's ability you know, as, as, as a leading foreign policy actor in some areas, peace and prosperity, but clearly you know, the development assistance, humanitarian aid, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That brings me to the end of mine. I'm now happy to roll on over to um, Alexander, um, and he will take you forward. A very good afternoon, everyone. Um, in uh, the coming minutes, I will give you a very quick uh, walkthrough to the um, role that the European Council uh, plays in the overall European architecture uh, and zoom in in particular on the, uh, the sort of overarching guiding role it plays in, uh, in EU foreign policy. Um, <clears throat> the European Council, well, uh, you've all seen the pictures. It are these it's this bunch of, uh, of, of, of people. So um, let's just start with, uh, with the very, very basics. Um, who's, who is member of the European Council? Well, it are all the 27 heads of state or government, um, plus the um, presidents, i.e. The, co the commission president, Barroso, the uh, president of the, of the council, Van Rompuy, um, and also the high representative for uh, uh, foreign policy, um, Cathy Ashton. Um, and normally the council meets four times a year to discuss the really important uh, issues on the agenda. Um, nowadays there are typically uh, rather often important things to discuss on the agenda. So in uh, the past couple of years the, the European Council has been meeting rather more frequently uh, and uh, the latest count for uh, the year 2012 was uh, six uh, formal uh, European Council meetings and then one extra one at, uh, at Eurozone level. The main thing to retain is that the European Council represents the supreme political authority in the entire European construction. Um, so they decide on the overarching issues that determine everything else. Um, in practice, that means they're responsible for the treaties and the provision of strategic direction for uh, all policy areas whenever the really hot potatoes uh, enter, enter on the uh, agenda. And we've seen uh, a very nice illustration of this just last week. It was um, uh, the most recent European Council meeting here in Brussels. Um, and the two big issues on the, uh, on the agenda were the multi-annual financial framework in which the heads of state and government um, collectively decided to cut uh, into the uh, European uh, budget for the uh, 2014 to 2020 uh, period, uh, which is something that uh, we had never seen before, that the EU budget actually can go down as well. But so now that decision was, uh, was, was taken uh, last year. I'll come back to that uh, at, the, at the end of my presentation because it sort of puts the European Council on collision course with, uh, with the European Parliament. And secondly, the European Council also uh, started looking into the dossier of what's happening along the, the southern neighborhood of the, of the European Union because uh, we're now nearly um, two years into the whole Arab, Arab, Arab Spring development uh, and uh, we've seen that actually um, the original drive towards democratization in North Africa is actually uh, a long-term process that completely trans transforms the, the political dynamics in that region of the world um, and actually also has um, uh, destabilizing consequences uh, in the, the sort of neighbors of the European uh, neighbors uh, farther down south in the, in the Sahel region where as you all know uh, a nasty little war um, was being uh, fought out um, earlier this year. The European Council has collectively said 
we're going to stay engaged in that whole dossier. Uh, we want some, some reporting being done on everything that the European Union is doing. And in particular, the European Council also expressed its support for the uh, intervention, the military intervention that France has undertaken uh, in the north of, uh, of, of Mali. So that are uh, the sort of type of issues that you can expect to see on the, uh, on the agenda of the European Council. The stuff where it really uh, matters a lot in terms of um, uh, requiring political attention from the very, very top. If we, if we zoom in in particular on the sort of standard role that the European Council plays for the common foreign and security policy, well, actually one can be very short. The European Council just defines the, the general principles and overall orientation of this policy area. Uh, typically through uh, a common strategy. So in 2003, the European Council adopted um, what is, uh, until the present day, the sort of uh, cornerstone document of, of European foreign policy, the European security strategy. Um, that document at some point uh, will require some, some updating. There was already a report on the implementation of the, of the strategy in 2008. Um, and uh, last year, uh, a handful of member states have, have called for the development of something that they labeled um, the European Global Strategy. There was an initiative launched by, uh, by uh, well, what was it, Sweden, uh, Italy, uh, Spain, and, uh, and Poland, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's not clear where, where that will lead. Um, but the overall engagement of the European Council, well, it always comes in when, there, when the overarching orientations um, pop up. So um, the, the next thing that is really formally on the agenda already is the theme of European defense, which will be discussed at the uh, Council meeting in December of, uh, of this year. So for the everyday um, uh, decision making uh, on launching new operations, uh, on uh, approving uh, bu major budget allocations. The European Council delegates all that to the Foreign Affairs Council, which meets more frequently uh, and which takes all the Council decisions um, to implement whatever uh, can be uh, decided upon. Um, in theory, in CFSP, there is some narrow room for maneuver. Um, in terms of uh, getting decisions taken by, by qualified majority voting. Um, for example, when the EU wants to assign a special representative to represent the European Union in a specific region. But in practice, that um, sort of decision making hardly occurs in, in practice. So typically, um, the European Council um, and uh, the Foreign Affairs Council, they always proceed on the basis of, uh, of unanimity when um, uh, foreign policy is is concerned. <clears throat> that means that the actual decision making logic um, of the, the European Council is um, well downright a game of diplomatic horse trading. Um, the member states um, sit together around the table um, and they negotiate uh, on multiple dossiers at, at the same time, um, and they have a habit of of linking. Dossier, different dossiers that are, um, in terms of contents, quite unrelated. Um, but there always needs to be a package deal in which all the member states uh, give something and get something um, in return. That means that in, in practice, um, the decision making uh, typically follows a lowest common denominator approach. Um, it is uh, also frequently happening that uh, a bunch of member states gang up on one specific or, an, or, or a specific subset of member states, um, threatening uh, to exclude them in an, in an actual decision if they, if they really refuse to, to, to sign up. So for example, late in 2011, um, there were uh, a group of, um, of member states which really wanted to move forward uh, in terms of uh, fiscal integration in response to the Eurozone crisis. It was uh, a move led by Germany to install uh, balanced budget rules in all constitutions, etc. The British refused to, to, sign, to sign up. Well, what happened? The Eurozone ganged up on, on, the, on the United Kingdom um, and uh, came to the decision of, in, of installing um, this specific proposal through uh, an, an, inter, an intergovernmental treaty outside of the 
um, of the EU framework. So at that point in time, uh, the British Prime Minister was, was completely um, excluded, but that is something that was, was now reversed uh, last week um, on, on, on the budget deal. So you sort of get the picture. It's always a game of, of, of give and take. Um, when I say that um, dossiers that do not have anything in common sometimes get linked in a broader package deal, well, the whole uh, Mali story provides a good uh, example um, of, 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 of that trend. Um, the European Union is now launching a military training mission to, to train the, the new Malian uh, armed forces. Um, that was something that has already been on the agenda for multiple years um, and that was consistently vetoed um, by Germany and, uh, and, a, and a handful of other member states. Well, at some point in the course of, of 2012, um, uh, Bundeskanzler Merkel suddenly gave a speech in which she said, actually, yeah, we're going to do this. Well, uh, Chancellor Merkel gave this speech after a meeting with, uh, with French President Hollande in which they must have come to some agreement um, that this was important enough and we can rest assured that there will be some other part of the deal that um, uh, is yet, is yet to, un to unfold. The important thing to keep in mind is in this whole horse trading process, the, the game of alliances is very flexible. It's not always the same member states that always uh, align themselves um, in, in, in the same blocks. So to make it very, very uh, simple, sometimes the French play the sparring partner of the Germans, sometimes they do the same thing with the British. It just depends on which, which policy area we are, we are talking about. I should also mention um, some words uh, about treaty change because it's ar arguably the, uh, the most important and the most profound um, uh, function of the, of the European Council. From um, the perspective of the European institutions, European foreign policy constitutes everything that happens outside the European Union. But of course, if you're sitting uh, at the head of a government uh, in uh, an EU member state, the question how the European Union itself functions is also um, a national foreign policy question. Um, and in, in that sense, it's, it's arguably the most important uh, question in uh, the national foreign policies of, of the different member states. Um, so there's a very elaborate way of, of talking about, well, how does the European uh, integration process actually moves forward. How does it all work? Um, so um, whenever the treaties need to be changed, well, typically there's the intergovernmental conference procedure that gets activated. Um, so for uh, a number of months, all the member states send a big delega delegation um, to uh, the, the negotiating process on, on how the treaties can, can be renegotiated or, or updated. Um, in the whole discussion about treaty change, you, you see that we have the same dilemmas and themes that, that recur uh, over and over again, um, because it's really about the balance um, of, um, of power, um, not only between uh, the individual member states, but also the balance of power between the, the nations, uh, the member states, and the European institutions. So it's always a question, to what extent are we going to delegate of policy-making authority downwards from the national capitals um, to the, uh, the institutions uh, in, uh, in Brussels and elsewhere? Hello. So um, actually, the title of my presentation was The European Parliament, or the Ordinary Procedure and the Open Method of Coordination. And um, in the lecture that I gave some time back, we did talk about all three of these things. But um, for a 10-minute presentation, this is even more challenging than it was for the one-hour lecture, and we did not really get to talk about all the details that we wanted to talk about. And for that reason, I decided to mainly focus on the European Parliament and slightly on the ordinary um, legislative procedure. If you do have any question on the open method of coordination, um, just contact me and uh, I can, you know, we can have a one-on-one -on -one chat. But it's just too, too much for this presentation. So focusing on the European Parliament, it's um, 
it's an old institution. It actually has been around for as long as the European Union, the European uh, communities and all these other um, formations before. So it, the European Parliament was already present or um, yeah, in, 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 in a different form in 52 in the European Coal and Steel community. It was not com called the Parli European Parliament at the time, it was called um, the Assembly. Um, and it was very different from what we know today. So at the time, the uh, delegates, the members of this assembly had a dual mandate, which means that they were a member of their national parliament and then delegated, sent to the assembly and also had the mandate to represent uh, their party and their interests um, in the assembly. Um, and also the Common Assembly did not have any legislative power, which is very different from the European Parliament today. So, um, but what it did have is it was notified by the Council and the Commission on various things and it was consulted. So it did play a role, but it did not have the same role in, as it has today in terms of being able to propose amendments, being able to veto certain decisions. Um, but very quickly, the parliamentarians actually sought to increase the power of the assembly. Um, with the Rome Treaties, it was called the European Parliamentary Assembly, so you already had parliament in the, in the name. And in 62, the parliamentarians themselves decided that they would call the um, European Parliamentary Assembly the European Parliament. So the name exists or is, is used um, officially by the parliament since 62 already. Um, what the Parliament had very early on was some kind of decisions in the budget. And that was something on the slides I call it the power of the purse. Um, so very quickly in the treaty, in the Rome Treaties, the Parliament got some um, role in, in, in the budgetary procedure. It, um, yeah, as I said, was able to propose modifications. And in a treaty of, the, of 1970, the um, assembly actually got the formal decision on the budget of the communities, um, but only non-compulsory expenditures. That's something that does not exist now anymore. And basically, it's not um, not the CIP, not the Common Agricultural Policy, but the other expenditures, which at the time were very limited. So the Parliament, for the standards at the time, didn't get much. But um, as we know now, these um, non-compulsory expenditures increased very much, which also increased the power of the parliament. And the parliament very strategically sometimes used this power, these limited powers that it had, to sort of put pressure on the council, on the commission, to get other things that it wanted, to um, threaten to veto these uh, non-compulsory uh, expenditures, for example, or similar things. So. Um, it didn't have much power, but it used it very strategically, trying to get more and more um, influence in other areas as well. And that's why, for example, in 75, member states agreed that um, the parliament has a right to make am amendments um, to non-compulsory ex uh, expenditures and to propose modifications to compulsory. So you see, step by step, it actually gained more power and that didn't um, stop there. And we know now with the Lisbon Treaty, the parliament is an equal partner to the council when it comes to the budget and, and many other policy areas as well. Um, so we do have the budget and, and the power is increasing very much in that area. And then another important development of the parliament is um, the way that it was composed. And that, as I said already in the beginning, was just a dual mandate. It was just delegates of national parliaments. But already in the Rome Treaty, there, was, there were provisions for the parliament to organize um, its direct elections. Um, the procedure was that the parliament had to make the proposal, which had to be adopted by the council. Um, and the parliament very quickly made these proposals in the 60s already. But if you remember the 60s, we had the anti-chair crisis, we had Charles de Gaulle not being very much in favor of supranational um, EU development. So um, definitely that was not a very conducive environment for agreeing on yeah, direct elections of the, the, the parliamentarians. But then in the 70s, finally, um, yeah, tight change, uh, the, the council adopted 
a proposal by the European Parliament for direct universal suffrage. And so since um, 97, the parliamentarians actually are directly elected and are not um, delegates of national parliaments anymore. Um, the, the elections, and I'll, I'll have another slide on that, actually take place every five years. Um, they're not uniform, it's not a uniform electoral system. You still have um, certain differences, and we'll get back to that. But you also see a tendency to the procedure becoming more similar in all member states, with even the United Kingdom in 99 introducing a proportional representation system and regional constituencies, which is something, something that they do not have or did not have um, for their national elections. Um, in terms of uh, legislative powers in general, as I said already in the beginning, the parliament didn't have many powers at all. But in the course of time, through the power of the purse and um, through own initiative reports that the parliament just adopted on various issues without having in any formal influence, it still you know, gained um, publicity, raised issues, and through that um, increasingly became a more serious player and also got more and more formal powers, um, which started with the Single European Act in 86, where the cooperation procedure was introduced, which already yeah, did not give the parliament equal powers, but um, at least there was some more cooperation and it was some more formal cooperation. Um, then we see with the Maastricht Treaty in 92, um, the cooperation procedure was extended and the so-called co-decision procedure was introduced. Co is what we now call the ordinary legislative procedure. It was a bit different at the time, but basically this is the procedure that makes the parliament an equal um, co-legislator to the council in the legislative procedure. Then, as I said already, it was a bit different in Maastricht. and the Amsterdam Treaty, this procedure was simplified. Um, now, if, if council and parliament have an agreement after the first reading, the procedure can be stopped. Um, and, and then, um, yeah, if there's an agreement that's being implemented. And um, so it developed, and nowadays we call it ordinary legislative procedure, and it is applied to many areas um, apart from foreign and security policy, and that's the area that Alexander spoke about a bit more in detail. Um, Going, I, I just put up a slide, it's a copy um, of, from a book by uh, Neil um, Nugent, and that just shows the electoral systems of, um, that are uh, implemented in the different states, uh, different member states, and it shows that there are differences. We have some kind of um, uniformity, but it's not entirely. So first of all, what we've got is uh, the represent representation per capita actually differs significantly, and that's something you know that we talked about in class more in more detail. Um, but I'd just like to point out, for example, if you look at Germany, so one member of the European Parliament represents 830,000 um, Germans, while uh, if you look at um, Luxembourg, with the, the smallest ratio, Luxembourg actually has one MEP per 80,000 inhabitants. So um, the proportionate, uh, the representation per capita differs, but obviously this is not possible in a di different way because otherwise you would have, well, maybe one Luxembourgish and thousands of Germans. Um, and, and then also, if you look at that, there's various other differences, and I just want to point out maybe that um, the the system is different in a way that. Every member state by now has a proportion of representation, um, but for example, the thresholds are different, um, and also the constituency, the number of constituencies is different. So a number of countries only have one single constituency, so the country is the constituency. But for example, Germany has the has 16, so the the um, different lender are different um, constituencies, and um, yeah, Belgium has five, for example, and uh, you know, you see this on, um, on this table. And then also, if you look at the turnout, Belgium, the only country with a compulsory um, vote, obviously has a very high um, turnout with over 90%. But then if you look at other countries, and I think the lowest, and this is uh, the 2009 elections, um, Slovakia only had 19.5%. So um, yeah, we do have still some quite some differences. 
in, in the electoral system, while, as I said, it already um, converged to a certain extent. Um, the roles of the power, and we already talked about that, it by now has significant legislative um, powers in the ordinary legislative procedure. There are also still some consultation and consent procedures, but um, they're not as dominant and frequently used as the, um, the ordinary procedure. And then the parliament can also initiate, um, well, adopt initiative report, which is something that's, um, that was already agreed between the, the commission and the um, parliament earlier, but now it's actually article 225 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, that the parliament by the majority of its composing members may request the commission to submit a proposal. So we know that the commission has the, um, the only uh, the only institution that can actually propose legislation, but the Parliament now can also request it, and then the Parliament has to, uh, the Commission has to respond in some way, although it's not specified in what way. Um, we talk about the budgetary procedure, which is very interesting at the moment. Um, I guess all of you followed the the debate on the multi annual financial framework at the moment. The European Council that Alexander spoke about found an agreement last week. But um, the European Parliament is now discussing about um, whether they should or could um, veto it. Um, they, it seems like they will have a secret ballot, and um, and the Parliament may, might, yeah, put in some requests and might actually even reject the budget. So this just proves how how important the Parliament actually is now as an equal um, legislator. Um, then. It also has a number of important supervisory um, functions. For example, the Commission President candidate um, should take into account the outcome of the elections to the European Parliament. That's also something that's relatively recent and it's in, in the Lisbon Treaty. And um, but the Parliament also holds hearings on the Commission President or the candidate for the Commission President and uh, the commissioners and. Um, and actually kind of grills the, the candidates for the commissioners um, in very lengthy procedures sometimes and then um, approves or not um, the commissioners and it can also dismiss the College of Commissioners. So in, 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 the, in the control and supervision of the commission, um, the parliament has very significant and powerful um, influence at the moment. Um, yeah, there's a number of other supervisory um, roles, but I think we don't need to go into that detail. Um, just very briefly, how does the Parliament work? Oh, I did have some uh, animation. So basically, at the moment, the Parliament has 754 NEPs, although the Lisbon Treaty specifies that it can only have 750 plus one president, so it's 751. Um, this will change with the next elections in 2014, um, and, and it has to do with um, Basically, the, the previous treaty, the Nice Treaty, um, only have allowing 736 MEPs, and then in 2010 it was decided, you know, since um, the Lisbon Treaty was coming up, um, to increase the number of MEPs while no one really wanted to give, give up any mandates already. But so it started after the next um, election, it will actually effectively comply with the Lisbon Treaty, and the Parliament will have 751 MEPs which includes the president. Um, it's currently, it, it works in committees. It currently has 20 committees that work on different areas. Um, for example, um, you know, foreign affairs, environment, and, and you can see the list on that slide. And also um, political groups are, are a very important organizational structure of the parliament. Um, and there are currently seven groups and, um, and it works very much like in national parliaments as well. Um, another very, yeah, particular thing of the Parliament is that it's actually a traveling circus, something that many people want to abolish, but it's still there because, um, yeah, it would have to be changed. It's now in the treaty, actually, so the, the treaty would have to be changed. Um, how, the way it's organized is that in Brussels, well, the MEPs will be in Brussels most of the time, so three weeks out of four. Um, the committee meetings, the group meetings, mini plenary sessions are held in the European Parliament building in Brussels. But once a month, more or less, 10 times a year, they go to Strasbourg in another fancy building um, to hold their plenary sessions. 
and part of the administration is still in Luxembourg. So, um, you know, and as I said, there's, uh, some people think that that might cause too many CO2 emissions, cost too much money and be very inefficient, um, but still for political reasons, this still has not been changed. Um, but the discussion comes up, yeah, on a regular basis. Um, here I just put a calendar, it's, uh, this is, is what a calendar of an MEP looks like and the different colors are for different weeks, so it would be plenaries and um, committees weeks, so when these different types of meetings are being held. Um, and then this is actually my last slide. As I said, we can't go into detail of the legislative procedures now because of time reasons, but basically the ordinary legislative procedure has become the, the most important um, way of making laws in the European Union. It applies to most policy areas um, since the Lisbon Treaty, not to foreign and security policy, as I said already, and, um, and the Parliament is an equal um, legislator to the Council. In, in this procedure. And then, of course, there are a number of other procedures that are, well, I would say, less frequently used than the um, ordinary procedure. And um, this is just uh, to show that actually the ordinary legislative procedure is not as controversial as you might think. So actually, in most of the cases, um, after the first reading, Council and Commission, uh, sorry, Council and Parliament find an agreement and the procedure is stopped. And then you have some of these high profile, um, very controversial lawmaking processes that actually go through two readings plus then the conciliation procedure um, until finally an agreement is found. And I stop here. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I will continue uh, now with the European Commission, uh, Commission's role uh, in external action. So I will focus. Uh, not so much on uh, on the uh, general um, European Commission's, Commission's um, um, competences or, or structure, but I but I will go directly uh, to the uh, topic of uh, its internal its external uh, activities and um, um, yeah power. So um, just. To, uh, uh, on the list of the Commission's task, uh, according to Article 17 of the treaty, uh, there are four categories, uh, four groups of competences. There is this right of, initi of legislative initiative, uh, almost um, exclusive uh, uh, right, but uh, actually in, in, in case of, of this external, EU external um, actions, uh, this uh, um, is a little bit limited. Um, then management, day-to-day -day management and implementation of the European policies uh, and the EU budget. Um, then EU, the European Commission is also called the guardian of the treaties. Uh, and the fourth uh, task, task on this uh, list, uh, the most important from the point of view of my uh, short presentation, is uh, the possibility to represent the EU internationally. Now, this uh, International representation is um, very much um, limited uh, already in the text of the treaty. In the Article 17, uh, Paragraph 1, we may we read that the, uh, this, uh, the European Commission ensures the Union's external representation with the exception of the common foreign and security policy. Uh, so already here we can see that the role of the Commission is um, limited, as I said, and it's, as we will see in a minute, uh, in a moment, uh, it varies from one area to another, but still there is this clear division, a procedural split, <coughs> and uh, the president of the European Council and the high representative um, um, deal with common foreign security policy aspects, and the Commission is responsible for more uh, Management-related uh, uh, tasks of non-common foreign security policy aspects of uh, external EU representation. Um, I come back to the slide that Amelia already presented because it shows very clearly uh, where, uh, in which areas um, uh, of the EU competence, uh, competences uh, the European Commission has the most 
um, the, the widest, uh, I would say, possibilities to, to act. And uh, of course, in this exclusive competitive, competitive system of the European Union, also the Commission can um, do more in, for example, uh, more than, for example, in uh, the areas which uh, fall under supplemental or coordinated uh, uh, EU competencies. So, uh, as you see from this uh, table, uh, trade and commercial policy and customs union competition rules, these are the areas uh, of uh, external actions where the Commission is very active. Also, in, um, in this uh, group of shared uh, competencies, uh, um, I would like to underline the development of humanitarian aid, where the Commission also um, is, is very active and, and can, can uh, do more uh, than uh, in the other um, policy areas. Um, what exactly the, the European Commission uh, does and what it can do, it's most the management, uh, as I said, the representation and the Commission also ensures a consistency of uh, this um, uh, external uh, actions, EU external actions. Mostly uh, there are those economic foreign policy areas, uh, uh, such as those that I already uh, mentioned before, trade uh, relations and um, uh, common commercial policy or or the, um, um, or, or, or for example, the competition policy, where the, where the European Commission has uh, extraordinary and, and, and very spectacular um, competences. And then um, uh, also in enlargement and development uh, aid, for example, the Commission is also very active, and I will come back to this in a minute um, when discussing the uh, role of uh, selected DGs. Then, of course, the Commission's role is very important in uh, negotiating, initiating, and signing international agreements in the trade and also in, um, in uh, uh, cooperation with uh, third uh, countries and with uh, international institutions. So the Commission also represents the EU in international uh, organizations. Um, the Commission as far as the link between the the day-to-day the -day work of the Commission and the common foreign security policy is concerned, the Commission is fully involved in the discussions and implementation of its uh, policy decisions. Uh, and also, uh, last but not least, the Commission manages the CFSP budget line. Um, this um, is maybe a good uh, opportunity this moment uh, is also good maybe to mention that uh, as far as the budget of the CFSP is, is concerned um, in current in the current uh, multi-annual financial framework so until the end of this year 2013 uh, under the heading called uh, EU as a global player uh, there were uh, in, in the budget in the EU budget uh, 5.7% of the budget was devoted to this to this heading, and in the future uh, multi-annual financial framework for the next seven years, the Commission proposed uh, uh, a higher um, percentage. It was supposed to be 7% of the total uh, multi-annual budget, but uh, during the recent negotiations, the, uh, the Council. European Council slashed this um, by 12 billion euros, and uh, according to this latest proposal, it will um, amount to 5.8 percent of the total EU budget. So it's actually the same as, well, more or less the same as it is uh, uh, currently. So uh, not much increase in the end. Well, of course, it depends very much on the decision of the European Parliament. Um, so, uh, uh, as for the day-to-day -day management of the EU policies in their external dimension, uh, the European Commission draws on uh, its um, non-CFSP DG, uh, and here you have the list of uh, uh, DGs, uh, 
um, and I marked with asterisk dosages which especially uh, play, play, can play or play uh, important roles in the external uh, activities of the European Commission. Here is, for example, climate action or competition, which I already told about uh, energy, enlargement, environment, but also justice, uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian uh, aid. And very interesting uh, um, in, uh, a connection between the ex European External Action Service and the European Commission is this service for foreign policy instruments. Uh, I will come back to this in a, in a moment. So, uh, just uh, as an example of these external uh, activities, I would like to point at the uh, uh, DG enlargement, which has a long success story of uh, successful activities because we we know that um, the EU the EU uh, grew from from six to 27, almost 28 now. But there is also still a lot to do. In this respect, because there are still several countries, uh, candidate countries, potential candidates, so this DG intensively works on um, on this uh, preparation process and procedures for this uh, um, potential or, or candidate countries. It also deals with in the instrument for pre-accession assistance um, and other funding and technical assistance for those uh, countries. The, the other uh, exam, example of spectacular uh, commission's activities, external activities, is the DG trade, uh, and this was already explained by Amelia that it, uh, this area of activity, of the EU activity, plays a really important role in this image of the European Union, uh, this external image and external role of the European Union. And this is not only about the trade of goods and services, but also in um, uh, commercial aspects of intellectual property, the famous ACTA um, agreement or non-agreement, uh, then uh, foreign direct investment, uh, custom tariffs, uh, trade liberalization process, and um, anti-dumping, anti-subsidy uh, procedures, and um, dispute settlement. In international trade relations. And of course, this is DESCO. Um, the EU is the largest donor in the world, so um, DG development and cooperation um, is, is very uh, active in this and, and has a lot of, uh, of tasks in this external EU um, activity. To sum up this part, the, uh, the role of the Commission varies, of course, uh, from, area, uh, from one area to another, but important is this general and, and, and uh, particular split between the CFSP and non-CFSP areas, and of course the Commission is uh, responsible mostly for this day-to-day uh, -day management of non-CFSP areas, and, and additionally, on top of this, manages the CFSP uh, budget line, which of course is also uh, may also lead to some tensions and, and overlap of competences. And uh, now, uh, last, I think, two slides about the uh, uh, changes um, uh, after the city of Lisbon. Of course, uh, you, you know it already that, uh, that the, the European External Action Service uh, was created and the position of uh, the high representative, who ex at the same time is uh, Vice President of the European Commission and directly mandated uh, by the Council, which of course is, it can also um, be an example of, of, of uh, uh, overlap um, and uh, the potential uh, yeah, reason for some tension. Uh, now, uh, as far as the link uh, between the European Commission and the uh, EAS is concerned, on the website of the European Commission, when you see the list <coughs> of the DGs, uh, you can uh, find this service for foreign policy instruments. And when you click there uh, uh, on this, um, you will be immediately directed, directed to the European External Action Service. So um, this shows this quite direct link. But um, when we look at the uh, 
a graphic presentation of European External Action Service. Of course, I know that this is not very clear, this, this slide, for you, but I show this um, only to, uh, to um, show you that here in this part, the gray, uh, gray units in this, uh, uh, in this chart uh, are the commission, uh, the link between commission and the uh, external action service. So this, this unit here in gray, they directly um, they are directly under the uh, high representative and they, pre they, they are sort of linked between the European Commission and the European External Action, Action Service, which is um, in, uh, basically the, the body, the body um, outside of the institutional, EU institutional uh, um, setup. Um, now, um, uh, almost, I'm almost uh, finishing. The president of the European Council, of course, this is a kind of a new, this is a new uh, position in the European Union after the Lisbon Treaty. And here we can see that there may be also uh, sort of competition for public visibility between the, uh, the president of the European Council and the president of the European uh, Commission uh, as far as the external activities of the EU are concerned. And uh, some authors, um, some uh, uh, researchers uh, point out that this uh, uh, new, um, the, the, the changes uh, introduced with the city of Lisbon to the uh, institutional structure of the European Union and to this external um, or, or the, the external actions of the European Union are complex and sanction charged uh, innovation. Um, thank you very much. I think now uh, Amelia will continue. Um, she will take the floor. Thanks very much, Magdalena. Um, again, we've had a whirlwind uh, towards horizon of some of the, uh, the key issues uh, building up through and past the Treaty of Lisbon, um, all of them connecting the EU's ability to um, act effectively, uh, efficiently, and sometimes the reverse uh, through its um, institutions. Um, I think it's probably been um, a, a strong offering. I hope one that's complementary with the, the lectures of, of Quo Vadis. And it therefore remains only for me to thank you for attending um, and to thank very much um, the speakers to Magdalena and to Cathy and to Alexander um, and also to Silvio for having uh, organized uh, the home thing. We had a few little technical hiccups, but I'm glad that you've all managed to, to stay with us. And a reminder that the next Jean Monnet um, uh, webinar, the Quo Vadis webinar number three, um, is in fact a different date than the original that you had, which was March. Now it's the 17th of April. And here we're going to be talking more extensively about EU foreign policy vehicles, CSDP, CFSB, et cetera. And here we're going to have Alexander back with us again, which is very nice, um, and include uh, Louis Simon and also Joachim Kopf. So do please uh, diarize that date, as they say. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in class uh, this Friday. A reminder that the room has changed to E305. It still starts at 6 p.m. And I'm delighted to welcome back Alexander to talk to us about EU strategic culture. We have had a, a variety um, of chats on the chat room here, and I hope that's uh, been helpful. Um, I don't actually see any little waving hands, uh, which does suggest uh, that you're all utterly, thoroughly exhausted <laughs> after the second Germanic webinar, which is just as it should be. Um, so I therefore look forward very much to seeing you in class. Uh, don't forget that you can download this once you receive the link. So if anything passed you by and you need a little bit more refreshing, that's the way to do it. Take care. We'll see you soon.